Well, welcome to Faith and Victory Church here on, on this wonderful August of 2012. And we're going to start teaching today, and I don't know how far we'll get, on uh, the importance of right decisions. My, my original title on this teaching is uh, Decisions, Decisions, Decisions. This is something I like to teach every one to two years um, because it's just it's a good reminder. And so if you've heard it before, that's okay. It's good to be taught some things over again. Amen. And more than once. Hallelujah. I mean, I, I know this. If you're, if you're taking math in school or whatever, I'll guarantee you, you, cert, you study certain things more than once. You study certain uh, theorems or certain concepts or certain uh, ways of doing things more than once and uh, had to go over them and over them. And, and, and how many just go, every time I hear, you hear the word math, you go, oh, oh, oh. I do it. I don't even like to hear the word. Amen. And that just the word can get kind of creepy. Amen. The word mathematics, especially modern math. Yeah, there we go. I got, I got a pain sound there. All right, son. One more and you're done. All right. He's got one college math to do and then he'll be done with math. Hallelujah. All right. Let's some. Let's, um, understand making right decisions. Your decisions have a, a causative effect. They can have a rippling effect. Uh, what you do with based on this decision can cause other things to happen and to transfer. And usually it does. It's usually not a one and out thing, one and done kind of thing. You understand what I'm saying? You know, you don't also make a decision to do something one time and then it's over with. Typically our decisions have a rippling effect or an ongoing effect and we need to understand it's important to make right decisions. Amen. Now, this is going to just kind of go right on to one of the things that we, we would understand, really understand. Knowing that you're having sex outside of marriage and getting someone pregnant is one of those things that carries on for 18, 20 years. Now, the world says go have an abortion. That carries on for the rest of the girl's life. The, the, the ugly details are not revealed through the abortion clinics and Planned Parenthood, not the, all that God is left-wing liberal bunch. Y'all know who I'm talking about, don't you? No, no, nothing, no punches pulled here that women who had abortions suffer emotionally. They suffer for years over the fact they killed uh, something in them that was alive. They don't tell you that. Oh, it's just fetal tissue, kill it. Okay? But that decision has an effect. And, and, and a lot of times psychologically, it's never seen on the outside, but the psychological effect for years goes on. All right? Uh, getting someone pregnant and then having the baby, that's a, year, that's, that's a rest of your life decision. It does not ha it's just not a one, one and done uh, event. It's, it's a rippling effect. Decisions we make in life, it's important we make the right ones. Amen. Now, a few years ago, Nathan was, uh, went, slipped out of the house with his rollerblades on, went over to the park with some of his little buddies, and they, they were challenging him to rollerblade down the park slide. He did it a couple times, caught serious air. They were all pumped about it. I noticed they didn't get on it. They just had challenged him to do it again. Well, about the third or fourth time he did it, when he went, went to get up, he was trying to get up higher, get, you know, the, the brake on the back of the wheel caught, and it flipped him up, and when he came down, he came down on his right arm, broke it here, and almost broke it in half underneath. All right? Well, they were, they finished their last regular season game of the year in Little League and were going into the tournament. And guess who didn't get to play because of a bad decision? Guess who had to swim, spend the whole summer sitting on the side of the pool like this watching us swim? <laughs> We had vacations. Plan that one 15-minute decision cost him seven to almost eight weeks of his summer. No little league tournament, no swimming in the pool. I mean, all kinds of stuff happened because of that decision. Decisions can be made that are good and decisions can be made that are bad. And it's important that we make right decisions in life. And the way we make right decisions is to understand the right, that we have the right to make decisions, how to make good decisions, knowing that people make bad decisions will cost them. We need to, you need to understand that there's a price for the wrong decision. Oh, I'm under grace. I don't care what you're under. You make the wrong decision, it will cost you. Hello. Well, God's grace will keep me. No, 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 no. You read your Bible and see what happens to our people. You know, Paul got real serious. He said, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall let the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the spirit of the, uh, will reap of the spirit of the eternal life. You, you know, if you sow to the flesh, you're going to get bad stuff. So let's look at this. First of all, God gave you the right to choose. 
You are not a robot. You are not a spiritual or physical robot under the hand of God where he makes you do things whether you want to do them or not. You don't make bad decisions because God made you make a bad decision. I know there are people who believe that. They're wrong. They're only reading part of the Bible. They, they get into the, you know, they get onto the, all the scriptures that, that deal with election and predestination, and they don't read any of the other scriptures that counterbalance that and bring truth into the matter. Amen. We're chosen. We, we are elect because God chose us. Or if you really see, I like this, and this is really the, the clear, clearest way I can say it. People who are predestined are predestined according to the foreknowledge of God that they would accept Jesus Christ. And what they were predestined to was to be conformed to his image. They're not pre every, everything you every you know. I chose to eat chocolate cake today. God chose me for you know before I was ever born from my mother's womb. Then on August the fifth, two thousand and twelve, at two thirty in the afternoon at Grandover, I was going to eat a piece of chocolate cake. No, you you decided to go eat at Grandover, and you decided to go up there to that um, that um, <laughs> dessert bar. <laughs> Hallelujah! And you decided to ha, glory to God to eat seven pieces of dessert. <laughs> 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 Make you shout. Amen. You weren't predestined to eat seven pieces of dessert and get a stomach ache and need Pepto Bismol. Hello. God didn't make you do that. You're pre if you're born again, you were predestined because God foreknew you would accept Jesus. You were predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Not what time you would eat dinner on the fifth. Or whether you would be in a car wreck or not. Or whether, I mean, some people go as far as to say, God made some people prostitutes. So when he saved them, they would be really appreciative. That's the dumbest. That's the dumbest stuff. And all that, all that's happening, if you take certain scriptures and, and, you, and you push them out, the rest of the Bible, you can make, you know, then you can take the other side of it, you know, which is uh, complete anarchy, you know. I mean, if you're, if you're saved this minute, I grew up Pentecostal. We were, we were kind of Armenians. You know, if I had served Jesus all my life and was faithful to church and faithful to God and loved the Lord with all my heart and prayed and did everything the Bible tells me to do and I cussed two seconds before Jesus came back, I would die and go to hell. Well, that's, see, those are extremes. All right? Let's understand this. God has given you the power to make decisions. You have the right to choose and to make decisions. And those decisions have consequences, whether good or bad. Amen? Hallelujah. Um, let's look in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Now, open your Bibles. I want you to go in your Bible. Hold your Bible up, shake it, and make the devil mad and Jesus glad. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, I didn't originate this. It was John Osteen's. Say, this is my Bible, my very own Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I have what it says I have. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Amen. I did that one time. Some lady wrote me a letter. You copied John Osteen. And? I didn't say it was mine. She chewed me out for not being original. Well, why, why am I going to come up with something else? His was good. Amen. I said his was good. I don't, need, I don't need to come up with something different. This is my Bible. Okay, we'll do it in French. It'll be original then. All right, hallelujah. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Look at verse 15. We'll start reading verse C. Let's back up to verse 11. That's, you'll, you'll, you'll see something here when we read verse 11. For this commandment which I command thee this day is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shalt say who shall go up for us into heaven and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that, we, that thou shouldest say who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. That sound like something from Romans? That is the word of faith which we preach. Well, that's where, that's where Paul got it from. People say, Paul didn't use the Old Testament. The Old Testament, well, Paul used it. He used to quote this whole passage and then called it the word of faith. Amen? See, I have set, listen, see, God's talking. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou, uh, thou goest to possess it. But if thou turn thine heart away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that you shall surely perish. And 
and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land whither thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that thou both uh, that both thou and thy seed may live that thou mayest love the Lord thy God thou mayest obey his voice that thou mayest cleave unto him for he is thy life and the length of thy days that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob to give them. Now stop here. Notice he says in verse 19 I call heaven to record earth and earth to record against you this day that I have set before you life and death blessing and cursing. In other words there's, there's a choice. It's a choice of life or death, blessing and cursing. And it is set before you. God didn't say, I'm going to make you. He says, therefore, choose. Choose. In other words, I'm going to give you a hint. And you have to be, uh, you know, really dishonest, blind, deaf, dumb, mute. I mean, everything. Not to know that life and blessing are better than death and cursing. Either that or emo. <laughs> You know, I mean, we got our young people running around now wearing black and cutting themselves and slashing themselves and, you know, tatting themselves up and getting gauges and getting weird and, you know, and uh, <clears throat> I mean, just, just do, doing destructive things to their bodies. And I mean, you know, just, just on and on and on and on. Why? Because they have, they've been sold a lie somewhere in the realm of, 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 of uh, thinking that embracing darkness, embracing death, embracing things of the curse is cool and it's destructive. I saw a girl a few years ago, I was at the water park and saw a girl came out and thought, my gosh, she's been in a horrific car crash. Found out later because somebody knew her, she was a slasher. She'd take a razor blade and just slash, slash, slash all over her body. Beautiful girl, except now her body, her arms, across her chest, I mean, on her stomach, on, on the other arm, all scars, scars. I mean, horrible, like almost like uh, branded scars from slashing. What's that from? The spirit of the world. The spirit of the world's entering in the people. Hello. And, they're and, and the spirit of the world tells you that, you know, uh, d death and curse is cool. It's good. It's right. But God says this. He said, I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. And this is what he says next. Therefore, choose life. Why? Why did he say choose life? He said, therefore, choose life that thou and thy seed may live. Thou and thy seed may live. <laughs> What's that tell me? If you choose death and cursing, things of death. Now, you're not talking about killing yourself, by the way, but you know, choosing the things of the kingdom of death. You're not going to live. You're not going to have life. You're not going to have goodness. You're not going to have blessing. And people think, you know, listen, I'm going to tell you something. You, you think, why do people drink and do drugs and all that kind of stuff? Because they hate where they're living. They hate the life they have. They're trying to escape from it. They're trying to get into an altered state where they're, 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 um, they have suppressed the emotions of dejection and rejection and depression and whatever because of the state they're existing and living in. God says choose life. I said God says choose life. Amen. In him is fullness of joy. Can you say amen? But notice God says here, he says choose. You have, God didn't say, uh, I set before you life and blessing and you can't walk in death and cursing because I'm your God and you're under grace. <laughs> now you're walking all that and you're blessed. Didn't say that. He said choose. Yeah. You have to make a choice. It is a choice that you must make to walk in blessing, amen, and life. Well, how do I do that? You do what the Bible says. You obey the Word of God. You speak the Word of God. You do the Word. We'll get to some of these other things later. But, you know, just kind of in a synopsis, you live according to the Word. Joshua 1.8 says, says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Now, understand the time that Joshua was written, there were the five books of Moses and Job. Job, uh, and, um, in chronological order, is the oldest book of the Bible. So all they had in around was Job and the five books of Moses. And the books of Moses were called the, the Law, or the Pentateuch, okay? I think I pronounced that correctly. And so when Joshua said this book of the Law, he's saying the Word of God, because that was the Word of God to the people. So New Testament uh, saying, we'll say the Bible, or the Word of God shall not depart out of thy mouth. 
but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success. Now one translation of the last part of Joshua 1 it says this and thou shalt deal wisely in the affairs of life. How did that happen? By feeding on the word of God. Meditate means to mutter, to say it over and over again. Speak it to yourself. You make a choice what you're going to feed on. Now, you may think Dr. Phil is cool. He, ain't, he don't know his head from a hole in the ground. You may think watching, you know, uh, the, the, I don't know if he, how many of these guys are even still on television, but Maury when they get, and, and all these shows and Jerry where they all get out there and everybody fights on television. You might think, that's just redneck on steroids. I bet they got Confederate flags and shotguns on gun racks in the back of their vehicles when they drive off that afternoon. Thoroughbred red. I can say that. You know, I grew up in redneck country. All right. Hallelujah. You know, th this is not profitable. It's not profitable to sit around. Uh, uh, Oprah is so new agey and all of her stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of glad she's not on anymore. That way we don't have to listen to her talk about her, all of her flaky new agey stuff. And have all of her new agey guests on and people just sit around and watch it. Oh, I just love Oprah. Why? Tell me why. What do you get out of her that helps your life? She understands me. And nobody understands you like God's Word. Amen. Nobody can help you like God's Word. Nobody can bring life to you like God's Word. Nothing on television destroys the yoke and removes the burden, but like the Word of God. The Bible says that the anointing shall destroy the yoke and remove the burden. Hallelujah. There's not one talk show host on television unless they're preaching God's Word that's giving you something that destroys yokes and removes burdens. Can you say amen? But you've got a choice. Open our Bible. Hello? <coughs> what choice are you going to make? Look at Joshua chapter 24. Not far away, just over a few pages from where you are. It's so important you understand. Now, I'm not saying don't ever watch television, but you know what? I'm going to tell you something. If you're in a tough place and you're looking for answers, those shows that come on after midnight ain't going to help you. <laughs> Hello? They're kind of like the shows that come on, you know, at, at 1 o'clock in the morning when you're sitting there eating your popcorn, drinking your soda, eating your Hershey's candy bar, and they're going to tell you how to lose weight without doing anything. <laughs> Buy this little machine, you know, your stomach, and then six weeks you'll have rock hard abs. You'll look like Kevin back there, you know, just because you put that little thing on and it electroshocked you while you were sitting around. You know, you know what you look like doing that? The coyote. You see the coyote after he's in his hospital. See, the world tries to always give us something where we can veg out and get benefits. But it doesn't work that way. You've got to make a decision that if you want the blessing, you're going to have to pursue the blessing. If you want the things of God, you're going to have to pursue the things of God by being a steward of the Word of God. The Bible talks about the being stewards, good stewards of the mysteries of God. You don't get them by watching 2 o'clock in the morning infomercials. Deuteronomy, I mean Joshua chapter uh, 24, verse 15. We'll back up to 14 and start the whole paragraph there. Now, therefore, fear the Lord. This does not mean be afraid of God in the sense of you're afraid of a rattlesnake. It means to be in awe. And I'll be honest with you. We've lost the awe of God in the church. We're not awed by his presence. We're not awed by the thought of displeasing him. Are you here? We're not awed to think that the creator of the universe would take on human flesh and identify with us and redeem us from our destruction and bring us into his kingdom and be, cause us to be born by his spirit again and be brought and be made alive unto God and be part of the body of Christ and seated with Jesus in heavenly places at the right hand of the Father. We're not awed by that anymore. 
because we get, we get real flippant about it. I got news for you. I don't know how long they've been up there. But about every hour or so, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders get up off their thrones and they cast their crowns at his feet and they fall down and begin to worship him and saying, worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou was slain and has redeemed us to our God by thy blood. He goes, I'm going to tell you, there is worship in heaven. There's an awe of God in heaven. Seraphims fly by his throne with six wings. They fly with two. They cover their feet with two, and they cover their eyes with two. And they cry out in the smoke of his glory, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And we get down here and get cocky. I want you to know you'll, you'll stand before the throne of God, and I'll guarantee you this much. You'll fall at his feet. I'm, I'm a righteousness of God. You go study your Bible. Even angels showed up to New Testament believers and they fell down. Don't lose the awe of God. So don't lose the awe of God. Don't become flippant and fleshly in your approach to him. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the master. He is the almighty. He is the glorious one. The smoke of his glory fills heaven. Hallelujah. Angels won't even look on him because of his glory. Hallelujah. We don't see more moves of the Holy Ghost in the church because people are flippant about their approach to the presence of God. Whew. Oh, yeah, there's different types of services. I know there's, there's services where people laugh and there's joy and there's, there's, that's the, it's the Spirit of God. And some people, just they just come in, they want to be flippant. I've been in the presence of God so strong you didn't want to move in fear or awe that you would displease him by anything you did or thought or moved or action because his presence was so sweet and precious, powerful. I grew up Pentecostal. I, well, you were Pentecostal. They were, they were all, I'm telling you, I've been in service in the Pentecostal churches you ain't never seen before. Power of God fall in such a way you couldn't, you, I mean, you didn't even want to breathe because the presence of God was so strong and so holy. Hallelujah. Don't lose the awe, the reverential fear of God to reverence his presence. They're anointing to do different things, but I'm telling you, don't, don't be flippant. Don't be fleshly. Hallelujah. Mm. Now, therefore, fear, reverentially fear, be in awe of the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and truth. Put away your gods which your father served on the other side of the flood in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You gotta, I've been in services where the presence of God came in really strong and people, well, they're not running or jumping or whatever. I got to go. I'm going to go home. I heard, I was at a camp meeting in 1980 and Fred Price was there and they were doing something. He stopped and he said, he started rebuking anybody that was getting up. <laughs> Sit down. Brother Fred got away with that stuff. Unless Mother Nature is calling you very, very loudly, sit down. People kept walking, went, walked, right on out the, walked right on out of the service. You can miss God or you can cause an entire congregation to miss what God had for them because you grieved the Holy Spirit in His presence. Got quiet here, didn't it?
put away gods and your fa- that, which your father served on the other side of the flood in the Egypt, and you served the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. I want to tell you something. The day you gave your heart to Jesus Christ, that's what you're saying. God forbid that I should forsake the Lord and serve, go serve other gods. For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up out, out and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage and did with, and, and with which did great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drave out from before us all the people, even the Amorites which dwelt in the land. Therefore we also serve the Lord, for he is our God. And Joshua said unto the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God and a jealous God. And he will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins if you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods. Then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you. After that he hath done you good. And the people said unto him, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said this, Ye are witnesses against yourself that ye have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Oh, my. That's what Joshua said. You can't serve the Lord. He's holy. Oh, we'll serve him. Do you, go, you go read, and if you read your New Testament and your Old Testament and do some study, that the Bible says the people of Israel looked for a way to return into Egypt. They tried to figure out how to go back. We got Christians doing that all the time. I said, we got Christians doing that all the time. They're trying to figure out how they can be a homosexual and be a Christian. You can't. You can call it hate speech. You can call it bigotry. You can call it whatever you want to call it. You're not controlling the dialogue with me by calling me something that's not true. Because that's all that is by saying I'm hate speech and I'm a bigot, is you're trying to control the dialogue of what I say because I don't agree with you. And by saying that, then I, you're trying to back me into corner and make me conform to you, what you want to do by calling me a name. Well, it won't work. It's not hate speech to say that homosexuality is a sin. It's not hate speech to say that pedophilia is a sin. It's not hate speech to say that bestiality is a sin. I mean, we're going to show up at Chick-fil-A with horses next week. I'm serious, folks. What happens when, when men start showing up with their little boys? Oh, God, that's, 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 that's wrong, Pastor. That's just, that's just wrong. Well, what, why is it wrong? Because if, if gay, this is just a choice, isn't it? You're not born gay, you choose to be gay. You're not born a lesbian, I don't care, just go ahead. Don't even bother sending me anything, I'm not going to read it. I'll just delete your email. <laughs> I'm not going to read it. So just don't even waste your time. Don't come showing up at our church outside. Amen. You're not born a lesbian, you choose to be a lesbian. But if you believe you're born lesbian, you're born homosexual, you cannot judge the pedophile because he says he's born pedophile. You can't judge the bestialitist because he says they're born as bestia in bestiality. That's the way that's their that's their sexual orientation. You can't have it both ways. It's either or. People are not born attracted to horses. Now I know I'm getting gross, but I'm telling you it's just it's the same thing. Perversion is perversion. Pedophilia is perversion. But people, cl the, the, the people claim that they're born that way, just like gays claim they're born that way. And if you say it's a moral judgment to say that homosexuality is wrong, then you can't judge pedophiles. You have no right to judge them and pass your moral judgment on them for whether they say they're born that way. No, they made a choice. People make a choice. And people try to, people try, to, try to figure out how they can be a homosexual and a Christian. People try to figure out how they can be an adulterer and a Christian. People try to figure out how they can be, you know, live in sin and be a Christian. You can't do that. If you want to live in blessing, you're going to have to live as a Christian and serve God. Why? He's a holy God. I said he is a holy God. One of the reasons that the church needs to address sin is this. God is holy. And I am telling you, when you come into contact with holy and there's sin, sin gets burned up. 
That was the whole symbolism in touching the ark. When they tried to steady the ark, remember? They weren't priests. They weren't covered. They touched it in a sinful nature, and it killed them. Not because God was trying to kill them. Sin came in contact with holy. That's why that's in the Bible. Sin is destructive. And, God, and Joshua says, you, won't, you can't serve God. He's holy. They say, we'll serve God. So let me say this. It's time we stop trying to figure out how we can live with one foot in the ditch of the world and one foot in heaven and get serious about God. Because your decisions have consequences. I knew someone a number of years ago. They were in our church. And apparently they were dealing with some things back then. You know, and got involved in some stuff. We had to remove them from a position in the church because they were, they were involved in some stuff that was grossly inappropriate. It was sin. Dealt in the lines of homosexuality. We know, that we, our, our, and listen, we removed them from, from the position, but we said, we want to help you. We want to minister to you. want to help you. They wouldn't receive the help. Said, all I want to do is get them out of their position in the church. Well, you can't keep, keep do, you can't be doing this and, and be in that position. Sorry. We love you, but you can't do that. We'll help you. We'll be here to guide you through. Well, they left, went to another church, went to a couple of churches, and just talked about me real bad. About two years ago, they left their wife for another man. Changed their name. They now have a different name. Tried to help them. You can't, you can't walk hand in hand. I'm talking about decisions now, making right decisions. You can't walk hand in hand with the world and expect blessing to come on your life. Hand in hand with the world will bring destruction into your life. I said it will bring destruction into your life. That's why God wanted to bring you out of Egypt in the first place and bring you into the land of promise. Stop looking for going back to, to building your life by stomping out uh, uh, hay in the mud pits and making bricks. It's bondage. It's destructive. It shortens your life. Egypt is not a sign of a good place to live. It was a sign of, of turmoil, of bondage, of a short life. But Canaan land was the promised land. God wanted to bring you out of that and bring you into the promised land. Amen? Now, I know I just hit on this other thing, but you know, let's, I mean, let's face it, we just had a week, a week in the news, and, uh, you know, the kiss-in, that was a big article on, on, on the New York Post of how bad the, the kiss-in busted. They couldn't find hardly anybody anywhere in the country at a Chick-fil-A doing the big kiss-in. It was in one, one newspaper article it said it this way. It said, tumbleweeds going down the streets would be a good symbol of what happened on that day. <laughs> it was a deserted movement. Yet on Wednesday, tens of thousands of people showed up at Chick-fil-A. I'm telling you, <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. Why? Because people know what's right and people know what's wrong. Well, you know, we got to love, I love the homosexual. I love the lesbian. I love sin, people who live in sin. I don't condone what they do and I don't agree with what they do. And just by saying, because I say it's wrong and you call me a hate speecher and a homophobic, you know, you're a heterophobe. I'm tired of your heterophobic comments. Hello, you're afraid of straight people. Hello? You're afraid of normal people. You're a normophobe. I mean, we're going to reverse it. We're going to start calling you, uh, you got normophobia. <laughs> the fear of normal. People make decisions that bring consequences. Amen. The Bible says in Romans, the first chapter, that when the men turn from the natural use of the woman and burn the lust one to another, received in their bodies their just recompense of reward. That's Bible. B-I-B-L-E. Well, that's the book for me. All right, anyway. You have to, I know I'm using some extreme decisions here. But you know what? And we're going to get to some others as we go along in this teaching. Decisions you make have consequences. And maybe they're not as, as, as blatant as some of, these, some of these open sins where people are trying to shut. And listen, I know people say, well, sin is sin. There's no bigger sin. You know, homosexuality is not a bigger sin than adultery. Yeah, but, you know, you don't have adulterers shoving it down your throat saying, I got to accept you as an adulterer. And you don't have, you don't have books in the library. My mom is an adulteress. 
at the schools for the kids to read. Like Heather has two mommies. Or some other book. I mean, what are we going to do? We'll start putting in there my daddy's, my daddy's lover's a horse? I'm, I'm, I'm harsh. This is, this is, <laughs> people are going to go, my God, Pastor, I can't. Listen, this is the reality of what we're dealing with. And the church got to stop being a bunch of weenies and running around saying, we just have to love people. No, we, love says your choices have consequences. Amen. That's love. Hello. Your choices, your decisions have consequences. That is love to tell people that. Just because you call me hate monger and all that doesn't mean it's so. I don't really care your opinion. You can hold up a sign and say, Pastor Ed Taylor's a hate monger. He's a bigot. He's a homophobe. I really don't care what you say. I know the truth. The truth is that if I don't tell you that it's sin, and if I don't tell you, I've got to answer to God. I, I'm, more, I'm more afraid of displeasing him than I am of your little words. Hey, I told, told Nathan last night the old saying we used to say as kids. Y'all, some of y'all older people remember it. I'm rubber, you're glue. Whatever you say to me bounces off me and sticks to you. He went, what? <laughs> That's how, how many, how many remember that one? Yeah, I got a whole generation out there. All right. Yeah, a couple generations. <laughs> In the arena of sin, there are consequences for our actions. Let's go to a Bible arena of sin. So we'll get off this other subject because some of y'all are so uncomfortable. I can look at your face when I say certain things and you're, you're just cringing. Oh my God, I can't believe you said that. And that's going on the internet. Yeah, because the world needs to hear it because the world's being told that the people are normal. They've done scientific, oh, here's another one. Just last week, they came out with a study. People who claim to be born again suffer more brain atro atrophy, 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 atrophy than no other people. Their brain shrinks more as they get older. In other words, if you're a Christian, you're a dummy. Yeah, and I, where are the internals on the study? How big was the sample? How long did they run the sample? I mean, you know, how many, how many, how many from this group and that group? You know, it's, it, and, and, and here's, here's the last one. Who funded it? Yeah. Every one of these studies are funded by some group somewhere. And if you got the anti-Christian group funding it, I can guarantee you they're going to come up with numbers and figures that please the anti-Christian group. Yeah. Why? They want more money. Who's funding the study? They don't do these studies for free. People run around and get grants all the time from people who do study. So you got to look at all that stuff. And then they didn't run any of that. They didn't, tell, they didn't tell who did the study. Didn't tell what the numbers were. Didn't tell who funded it. Didn't tell how many were in the sample group. Didn't tell how long it was. Just posted it and people picked it up and started putting it on the, on the, on the newspapers. What for? Make us look stupid. I got the mind of Christ. I'm smarter than anybody. Amen. I may not know what ECE equals MC square and its, and its relationship to life, but I do know born again and baptized in the Holy Ghost. I do know that serving God, he'll give me the wisdom I need to live life and have it successfully. Amen. I do know that when God's in my life, I'm a winner. Hallelujah. No matter what, I'm the head and not tell above, only not beneath. Amen. Now, let's look, if we will, at some decisions made by people. We're going to get into this one. We're, we're going to wrap it up on this one this morning. We'll come back to some other. But go over to 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. We're gonna read, we might hit and miss in here a little bit. But chapters 11 and 12 you need to read. Okay? Just read the chapters. Go home and study. That's your homework. And it came to pass after the year had expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Re Rebah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. Now, just stop here. Where's David supposed to be? What is David? What did it say? It was what did the kings do at this time of the year? Where's David? He sent somebody else in his place, didn't he? That was what? A decision. Now, well, it was bad, but this is start out. It's a decision. He made a decision rather than go fulfill his duty as king and lead the battle. He sent somebody else and he, he hung out at home, didn't he? 
Now, verse 2. And it came to pass in the evening time that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. Stop. Guess what David would not have seen had David done what he was supposed to do in verse 1? The woman. And she was doing what? Washing herself. How many know when you take a bath, you do it with your clothes off? Hello? How many hopped in the shower this morning with your pajamas on? I didn't see anybody raise your hand. How many go home and draw a bath and hop in there with all your, your, your suit and your tie on? No, nope. what's the woman? She's taking a bath. She is what? It's a bit like this, butt naked. All right? Now, David's the king's palace. Guess what? His house or his rooftop is higher than anybody's. Why? He is the king. But where? Now, you got to think, well, why was she up there taking a bath if he was home? Where was he supposed to be? As far as she knows, he's supposed to be where all the other kings are. He ain't supposed to be up there. So his decision has now set him up to what? See something he shouldn't have seen. And he looked longer than a glance. How do you know? Because it seems very beautiful. He didn't go, oh, my God. And if he did, he went, oh, my God. Dang it. Verse 3. Actually, it says she was very beautiful to look upon. I mean, he was doing, he was doing Polaroids with his eyeballs. Hello. And David sent and inquired after the woman. I mean, he came out there and said, who is that woman? <coughs> and one said, it is, is, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came into him, and he lay with her. That means they had sex. Let's get rid of the King Jimmy. They had sex. And for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David, I am with child. And in other words, you got me pregnant. And he know one her husband. Why? Because he's out where the king's supposed to be. And did, now here we got a problem. He made a decision not to do what he was supposed to do. Let me tell you something. Every woman in Jerusalem could have been on their housetop butt naked taking a bath, and it wouldn't have mattered if David had been where he was supposed to be. He would have never seen it. I said he would have never seen it. If he wasn't there, he couldn't have seen it. If he'd been at battle in his tent leading the armies, he wouldn't have seen her or any other woman. Y'all hear you going home. Now, I'm just going to throw something out for supposition. It could be that the rumor got out that people, women were taking baths on the rooftop when the guys were gone because there wasn't nobody to see them. And he chose to stay home. You always have a choice to do right or wrong. The big question is, what are you going to do? You're going to do right or you're going to do wrong? It doesn't take a whole lot of effort to do wrong. Thank you for your enthusiasm. So she said, I'm pregnant. David sent to Joab and said, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Job sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was coming to David, David demanded of him how Joab did and how the people did and how the war prospered. Yeah, he just, he's making small talk. And David said to Uriah, go to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house and followed him a mess of meat from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and went not down to his own house. Now, he just called him in and had small talk with him to make it sound like it was a legitimate business call. This was a legitimate inquiry into how, he knows, he knows how Joab was doing. How do you know? Because he, he called Joab to have Uriah sent. He said, he could have found out from Joab how Joab was doing. Instead of saying, send me Uriah, he could have sent a letter down there and said, how you doing, dude? 
enjoyable to sit back. Everything's good, King. Cool. All right. So he didn't have to have Uriah to come back to tell him how Joab was doing. Amen. Small talk to make it look like a legitimate inquiry from the king. Now, what's happening here? This is called cover up 101. If Uriah goes and sleeps with his wife and they come back from the battle and she's pregnant, well, late, early, you know, whatever, you know, those things happen. He'll say, well, I got her pregnant when I was home. And he's a little early. Don't look anything. He actually looks like the king. But anyway. <laughs> But the king's a man of integrity. He wouldn't do that. <laughs> He's trying to get him to go sleep with his wife, have sex with his wife, so he can say that, it, so it won't be, so it'll be questionable as to whose baby it is. And when they told David, saying, Uriah went not down to his house, David said, Uriah, comest thou from thy journey, and thou didst not go down with thy house? And Uriah said unto David, it's tough when you get people of integrity, that the ark of Israel and Israel and jo Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in open fields. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife as thou livest and as thy soul liveth? I will not do this thing. And David said unto Uriah, tarry here today also, and tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah drove a boat in Jerusalem in the, uh, that day and on the morrow. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him and made him drunk. Man's going to make him get him drunk. In the evening, he went out to lie on his bed when the servants of his Lord, but went not down to his house. He tried to get him so drunk, he'd forget about his integrity to go have sex with his wife. He didn't do it. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter, Sit ye Uriah in the fort, front fort of the hottest battle, retire from him, that he may be smitten and die. And it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah in a place where he knew the valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab. And there fell some of the people of the servants of David. And Uriah the Hittite, Hittite died also. Now, here we have, we have King David. We have, we have adultery. Now, and really it's almost rape because he's the king. She has to do what he says. It, it would be considered, uh, let's say there's authoritarian rape. Because he had, he's the king, he says, come to my house. She has to come to his house. She could be killed by, by disobeying. Had sex with her. So he uses his position of authority to rape her, basically. Happens in churches. People think that the pastor is some, you know, you know whatever, and they, they take that advantage of the women, and, and they have sex with the women in the church. They're raping them. Actually, it's incest because he's the father of the church. Spiritually incest. That's gross, I know, but anyway. I'm just getting real blunt. I'm just, that's a blunt sermon. But you know, it's time we stop Mickey Mouse around with, with the way the world talks and tells us how we have to live and have to think. Hello. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Say we love the pastor. Hallelujah. So David has convinced an adulterous rape, whatever you want to call it, if it's adultery or rape, it's strong, with another man's wife, brings the man back and tries to have a cover-up, gets the man drunk, gets him in the sin by getting him drunk, all part of his cover-up plan, conspiracy to commit a cover-up, and then when none of that worked, he becomes involved in the conspiracy to commit murder and sends this man with his own letter to go back and have himself killed. And involves his chief, his general of his army in the conspiracy by telling him to put him in the hottest part of the battle and withdraw from him. Don't you know that was hard on that man? He's, if, he's, if he's a leader of any kind, he had a difficult time following that order, but the king said to do it. His sin not only affected him, but let's, let's back up here. Where was he supposed to be? In battle. But because he's wasn't, he wasn't in battle, what's happened? Adultery, illegitimate conception, cover, attempted cover-up of a crime, getting another person. Now it's, now it's affected David. It's affected Bathsheba. It's affected Bathsheba's husband because he got him drunk. And now he sends him back to battle and has him put in the hottest part of the battle. Now Joab is part of a, a murder conspiracy. And all the soldiers who withdrew from him become part and parcel to the sin. 
off of one decision. One decision not to go to battle brought all these other people into sin and participants of sin because of one decision. Because I can tell you, had David been in battle, we would have never heard of Bathsheba. She wouldn't even be in the Bible. Hollywood makes David and Bathsheba a love story. It is a sin story. There's nothing to do with love. He didn't look at her and have her come to his house because he fell in love with her. He got in lust over her. <coughs> Hello. And then after her husband died and she had her days of mourning, he brought her in and married her, but then the child died. Yeah, yeah, but Pastor Ed, you know, I mean, David's son became, yeah, whoa, 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 forget all that. Oh, let's back up. Let's back up. There's stories of reconciliation and restoration and mercy, but I'm telling you, this is not the story of love. It is not a romance story. It is not a love story. It is a story of bad decision causing other people, people to fail and other people to be brought into sin because of your decision. That is why it's important for us to make right decisions because it doesn't just affect you. Men, you're living with your wife and you go out and have adultery. It's not going to affect you. It's going to affect your children. You're going to affect your children. You're going to affect the next generation. You're going to affect the next generation. Women, you want to go to sleep with that other man and, he's, and you're married and you got kids, I'm telling you, you're going to affect your children. Hello? What decisions we make in life have consequences, whether good or bad. Whether good or bad. Hitting your, I mean, beating your kids. Now, listen, I, I, I think there's a proper spanking of your children, but abusing your children is a different story. You should spank your children. I believe in spanking. God gave us a place to spank. It's extra padding. It's designed. Hello. It's, des it's perfect, perfectly designed to inflict enough hurt that they know they can't do that. I don't hit my children. I talk to my children. Talk to a two-year-old. See how well, you know, I mean, I, we, were, we were somewhere recently, and this little girl got mad. She was about six, and her grandmother dropped something. She went, Nana, and got mad with her grandmother because people, something felt that. And I'm, I turned to Janie, and I said, kids, kids don't respect anymore. They watch Disney, and they watch Nickelodeon, and they're told to have attitude and to be, it's, it's free spirit, and it makes them more mature. I think they, need to be, they need to be wall hangings for a little while. You need to plaster them up against the wall and hang them up there for a little while. Hello? They don't understand that. No, we don't talk that way. They understand back in hurts when I talk that way. Are you teaching? No. God says he who spares a rod hates his child. I don't believe in spank. Well, you don't believe the Bible, and you're an idiot. Amen. I'm just telling you, you're an idiot. You shouldn't talk to me that way. You're raising a generation of dummies with no respect. Wait until they get in your face. You see how well you like it when they get up in your face and tell you I ain't doing it. It's four years old. Hello? It's amazing how it changes when all of a sudden you start, they start getting in your face and telling you they're going to do what they want to do. I'm 12. I'll talk to who I want to. I'll call who I want to. It's, you know? You see that telephone you got in your hand? Let me see it. I do the bam-bam on it. Take a hammer and beat it, the daylights out of it. Now, here, call whoever you want to call. You call whoever you want to call. Hello? You got that right? How come I got off on that? Anyway, people make decisions. Had David been where David was supposed to have been, the story of Bathsheba and David would have never been in the Bible. Uriah's murder would have never taken place. We would have had a different king of Israel. Hello? Y'all hear you going home? Joab would not have been a general who had to live with the guilt of killing one of his own soldiers. Come on, church. 
if David had made the right decision when it was presented to him. Now we'll talk about right decisions later. Tonight we'll be preaching on, on healing and, and faith along the lines of healing. We'll pick up here next week, okay? But let me say this. You can't afford to walk around life making bad decisions. They affect too many people. You're not an island unto yourself. And as a Christian, you need to make right decisions that help people. And, you know, and you're going to, it's going to not cause destruction. You don't need to leave a path of destruction in your life. Making right decisions, biblical decisions. You can see from the Bible, making the wrong one can cause a lot of trouble. Oh, hey, I don't know if he made it as a whim. I don't know if he just kind of got, you know what, I'm kind of tired of doing this annual king fighting thing. I'm just going to stay home this year. I don't know if it was like that. It just says he remained behind and sent Joab in his place. We don't know what all that went into the process of making that decision. It could have been a last second thing. He could have been packing, the, packing his mule. Or his servants could have been packing his mule. He says, ah, put that back. I'm not going. Whatever it was, however long the decision took to make, he made it. And the wrong one was costly and brought destruction and hurt because he made the wrong decision. Right decisions are imperative. Wrong decisions are destructive. We'll get in next week. We'll talk about some other people. About, you know, uh, Abraham made some wrong decisions. Uh, Adam made a wrong decision. Dear Lord. <laughs> I mean, we can go back now. Man, if Adam just made the right decision, we wouldn't have any of this mess. <laughs> Jesus wouldn't have had to come. You know, we'd all be in the garden. Hallelujah. Running around in glory all the time. Aren't you, we, we, you wouldn't be naked. You'd be covered in the glory. We wouldn't see your nakedness. Hallelujah. I mean, you wouldn't have to be afraid of bears or lions. Tigers, bears, and lions. Oh, my. Tigers. <laughs> How's that ever that goes in? Lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. All right. Stand up. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the service. I know we were blunt, but we've got to, we've got to be arrested. That, that, what, the decisions we're making in life have consequences. And they have consequences far more reaching than just our own little circle. They reach out beyond that and affect others. Father, so I think they're challenged. I think you speak to hearts and say be aware of your decision making. Be, a, be aware of making it in line with the word of God and being godly. In your decisions, as every head is bowed and every eye is closed, if you're here today, you're not born again. Jesus Christ is not the Lord of your life. Raise your hand. I want to pray with you. Anybody here, your backslid? You made the decision just to stop going to church, stop serving God, and just come out, kind of go out in the world, and you woke up eating pig slop and found out it ain't all that good. Anybody here this morning, your backslid, you want to get right with God? Raise your hand. One more offer. If you're here this morning, you're not baptized in the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues, just like Acts 2, 4 said. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Raise your hand. We're going to pray for you. Lay hands on you and get you filled with the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> all right. Look up at me. When we don't want to leave you, let you leave here without getting an opportunity to do everything like God. Thank you for joining us today at Faith of Victory Online. We appreciate you tuning in and watching our services. We know that God loves you. We love you. The Word of God will work for you. And if you will make right decisions, good things will happen in your life. We'll be continuing this series over the next few weeks. So we invite you to join us for each and every one of those services and get blessed and get the Word of God. And with that wisdom and knowledge that comes out of God's Word, it will transform your life. If you would like to contribute to Faith of Victory Church, we invite you to go to www.fvc.org click on our online giving tab and go from there. All the instructions are there on how to give and so forth and we would appreciate you supporting and working with us in the ministry together as we reach the world. Our broadcast goes all over the world. We have people from China and from Europe and from the United States, South America all over the world they are tuning in to the Faith and Victory broadcast. So we invite you to help us reach them and continue to reach them with the Word of God. Until next time, remember this, that this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith.